Thanks a lot, everyone, for joining this call. We are recording this webinar. So uh, you'll all be receiving a recording in one or two days. So in case if something is unclear or if you want to revise something, you can always go through the recording once more to clarify your concepts. The main topic which we will be covering today is preparing the documents for graduate school admissions, especially for fall to 2025. The deadlines for which are coming up in two to three months. This webinar will be useful for students not only applying for next fall, but also for everyone who is interested to apply for graduate school admissions. If you have any doubts or questions, please ask them in the chat. We won't be uh, taking questions through voice, but we'll take the questions through the chat due to the large size of the call. Again, the meeting is recorded, so don't worry about missing some aspect. Let's get started with today's webinar. We are team Videsh and the main aim is to help you land your dream university. Many now. This about us. This webinar for us. Ms. Dr. And our very. like MIT, Stanford, Purdue, UIUC, uh, CMU, Columbia, etc. So me and uh, Dr. Shridhar completed our PhDs from MIT and then we returned back to India uh, along with Dr. Rajat who completed his PhD from Purdue. All of us came back in 2022. While we were doing our PhDs, we, re we really appreciated the value of research. And that is why all of our webinars, including this one, has a lot of emphasis on research. Research is one of the most important and crucial elements which will help you in your graduate school applications and not many students know about this. Building a strong research profile is one of the most impactful things which you can do in your application along with the documents and we will be stressing on that a lot in today's lecture or today's webinar. So the main, the reason why we are conducting this webinar is that when we applied to grad school, we did not receive guidance in a structured manner at all. Uh, we did not know what to do and it was a big struggle. We had to contact seniors. Sometimes the seniors did not reply and we had to figure out many things on our own. The goal of these webinars is to give you very important information in a very condensed manner so that you don't face the same struggles like we did. With that, let's get started with today's webinar. The agenda for today's webinar is pretty clear. We want to first give you an overview of the graduate school application process an overview of the timeline which you need to follow starting from September, uh, which is right now. And then we will dive into documents such as SOP, resume, letter of recommendation, portfolio website, and then we'll go through our signature long-term mentorship program. There will be time for Q&A also towards the end. So if your questions are not answered in the chat during the webinar, don't worry. We'll always go through unanswered questions at the end. But please stay proactive, ask questions, uh, because we usually try to answer many questions throughout the webinar itself. In my part, I'll be covering three aspects. I'll be covering the overview of the application process, uh, the timeline which you generally need to follow, and how to craft a statement of purpose. I'll also be demonstrating the statement of purpose which got me admits into MIT and Stanford. So that section will be very useful for you. Okay, let's get started with the first part, which is the overview of the graduate school application process itself. Now, before you come to the documents, there are some critical decisions which you need to make. The first decision is whether you want to apply to a master's or to a PhD. So can people in the call mention in the chat just master's or PhD based on what you're planning to apply? If you're not sure, you can just say unsure. That also is fine. Um, but if you are not sure, the first decision you have to make is whether it's going to be a master's or PhD. And uh, this decision will change many things as, as I'll explain. The first thing it will change is the time duration and the commitment. In my experience now, a person should only do a PhD if they really love doing research or if they want to become a professor or go into academia in the long run. If you, if you do not have experience with the research process, if you do not know what it takes to start a research problem and take it to completion, 
the less riskier option is probably going for a master's degree because it's two years. PhD on the other hand is a big commitment in the USA. It's a commitment for four to six years in Europe. It's a bit lesser, but any, anyhow, when you go for a PhD, you have to stick with one problem for a pretty long period of time. And that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, so just make this decision wisely. Remember that even if you go for a master's, you can anyways later take a decision of whether you want to upgrade to a PhD or you, you want to go to a job. So that option remains open for you when you go for a master's degree. Okay. Now, uh, the second decision which you need to make after deciding whether master's or PhD is whether you want to apply for fall or spring. So the difference here is that if you apply for fall, so let's say if you are applying for fall 2025, your semester will start in US or Europe in August or September of 2025, which is the fall semester. That's why it's called fall 2025 and the deadline typically closes in December of 2024, which is around uh, four months from now. Spring admissions are a bit rare. So the spring deadlines are almost already over. If, if all of you in the call uh, are do want to apply to spring 2025, the deadlines for most colleges have already passed. Uh, and anyways, we recommend students to generally apply for the fall cohort because the admission the number of people who apply are more, the intake is more. And if you apply for fall, the time at which you will do internships aligns well with the summer season. So let's say you have decided that you want to go for a master's degree and you want to apply for fall 2025. The next thing is funding. Now remember that if you go for a master's, the drawback is that uh, it's usually a bit hard to get funding for international students. Um, Normally, people take educational loans and you need to be aware that the magnitude of these educational loans is usually uh, pretty high for masters. It's around the order of magnitude of 50 to 60 lakh. A PhD on the other hand is a bit different because most PhDs are almost fully funded. For example, my PhD at MIT, I did not have to spend a single money from my pocket. Uh, in fact, we got a stipend. We get a stipend at PhD. So you, in fact, earn, earn some money. Uh, so that is another distinguishing factor. One reason why I went for PhD is also because of the funding. But remember that that should not drive your decision. The reason for going to a PhD should mostly stem from your love for research or the fact that you want to become a professor or enter academia in the long run. So start planning for an educational loan. Uh, the Another way to get funding for masters is through an RA ship or TA ship, but that happens after you get admitted into the university. So you have to email professors and inquire about positions in their lab. Now, let's say once you have decided that, let's say you want to go for masters, you want to go for fall 2025. Then you need to have these, these things ready. You need to have a resume. You need to have a statement of purpose. You need to have three strong letters of recommendation. These are, these are the minimum requirements. On top of that, if you have a good GPA, if you have a strong research profile, that's very good. And that will make you stand out in the application. Many universities have waived off GRE scores. So you need to check whether the university you are applying for needs this score or not. Uh, TOEFL scores are mandatory for many US universities. Now, after making these important decisions, you have to set a timeline, right? So uh, here I have just mentioned a timeline. So we are in the month of September right now. All of you in this call who are applying for fall 2025, to definitely 100% start making your statement of purpose resume and your portfolio website right now. Don't delay it further because these documents usually take a bit of time. You should also start shortlisting universities at this moment. Just don't make a final list right now. Just maintain an Excel sheet of all possible universities which you plan to apply for. Because this is also the time when the university portal opens. So don't leave this, these things to later. You need to start doing this right now and don't delay it any further. Now, uh, what happens in the month of October and November is you, you usually get your SOP resume reviewed from seniors who have been through the process. We can also help you in this through our long-term mentorship program. But do get your SOP and resume reviewed from someone who has got admits into top universities. Don't get it reviewed from 10 to 15 random people who don't have experience with this process. A good review makes a big difference. People who have been admitted to top universities, they will give you critical feedback, but that feedback will also improve your documents. For example, when I sent my SOP to a student who had got admitted to Princeton, he gave me really, really critical feedback. 
and that really <laughs> affected me at that time but i took it seriously and i made 8 to 10 revisions and i believe that feedback eventually got me into mit and then please please maintain a list of the deadlines for the universities you are planning to apply don't miss these deadlines the deadlines for many universities at least in the us is between december 1 to december 15 and all of this information is given in the on the university website so you need to start maintaining an excel sheet where you document all of the names of the universities and their deadlines also okay now let's come to the document which i am going to cover and this is the most important document in the application process this is called as the statement of purpose so uh, how many of you in this call have written the first draft of your sop can you type yes if not you just type no uh, we just want to get a sense of how many of you have written the first draft of your statement of purpose uh, i can i can see like maybe half yes and half no that's totally fine because whichever category you belong to you need to refine your sop a lot before it gets to a final shape and what is the statement of purpose it's that document which you write to the admissions committee to convince them to take you for the program the way it is different from the resume is that resume is objective you cannot insert emotions an sop is like telling a story you can write statements like i worked on this problem for so long that uh, i became indifferent to time and work and uh, i got really beautiful results towards the end and that justified all the hard work and passion for the subject we cannot write statements like this in the resume so an sop needs to be a very good story that's why it's this document which distinguishes you from other candidates the better story you tell the better chance of getting admitted and there is a specific way to tell this story we have reviewed over 400 applications now and there is a common pattern to people who write the best sop there are usually four common elements the first is called the thread the second is called the hook the third is called the supporting cast and fourth is casting the net now you might be thinking what are these elements right let me explain this now whether you have written your sop first draft or not these steps remain same for both categories first of all ask yourself the question that what's the thread the thread is that unifying vision which binds your entire sop together so i have interacted with many students and they say that they are interested in fluid mechanics plus computational physics plus machine learning that's a scattered vision you need to have one unifying vision which binds your entire sop together this is sim this sounds simple but it's actually pretty hard because we have done so many things right in the university that sometimes it's difficult to come with one common thread so here i am showing you three paragraphs taken from my sop which got me into mit and whenever someone reads my sop whether i get selected or not one thing is pretty clear that my thread is very clear i want to create an impact in the field of fluid mechanics that's it it's not scattered so let's say you read this paragraph right this is the first paragraph of my sop and i'm i say in the last sentence that i am keen to create such an impact that is fine but before this you see this very pursuit has inspired me to deeply explore the field of fluid mechanics and to create an impact in this field this is my thread and at several different paragraphs in my sop i reiterate this thread so for example this is a paragraph in the second page of my sop and here i again say that a masters degree followed by a phd becomes an ideal choice for me to channel my passion in fluid mechanics in fact i'll show my entire sop to you in some time you will see that i mentioned fluid mechanics everywhere all of you should have one thread which binds your sop together so you might be thinking if i've done work in fluid mechanics as well as heat transfer then how what is the common thread the thread can be dynamical systems under which both these things come together try to think of that one unifying vision which binds your entire sop together that's the first step the second step in writing an sop is the hook the hook is that aspect of your story which is your biggest strength in our experience the best hooks are usually gpa or publications conference journal publications being part of a prestigious internship or fellowship etc this is that point which will distinguish you from others and it immediately immediately catches attention of the admissions committee for example here are the two paragraphs in my sop which i believe got me admitted to mit uh, so these are the paragraphs in which i talk about my journal uh submission to a journal and here you see i write that after a year of effort i was at the forefront of developing this new law the involved physics was simple and beautiful yet it explained a complicated phenomena a journal paper describing this work is in publication 
and we plan to submit it to the journal of fluid mechanics that's it that's my hook i knew that this will distinguish me from other students because no other student had a publication in this prestigious journal in my batch my class rank was 10 in a batch of 40 students so and everyone was applying to the same universities but no one had publications that's why we keep stressing on the importance of research and research publications it's extremely important now if you at this moment the gpa is fixed we cannot do anything about it but if you don't have a hook you can cultivate it how can you cultivate it because you can always be part of a literature review paper or a research paper along with a professor or with a group of students you can submit it to archive or to a preprint even if you are applying for fall 25 there are four months left so although the gpa cannot change at this point you still have time to build your research profile so if you don't have a hook develop your hook the third thing is in called the supporting cast so basically all of us have done some random yet impactful things in our life right which may not be directly related to our thread for example, my thread was fluid mechanics, but I had done an internship in installing solar panels, completely unrelated. So how did I add it to my SOP? I used this sandwich technique. The sandwich technique is that you start that paragraph with your thread, you end that paragraph with your thread, but in the middle, you sandwich your experience. So here you see, I write about my ITC internship installing solar panels in the middle year, but at the start and the end, I bring them back to my thread of fluid mechanics. So that's how an, an admission committee member goes through this paragraph. They'll be impressed by my ITC experience. And at the end, they'll be brought back to the thread. This is how you can uh, insert random yet impactful elements in your statement of purpose. And then the final piece of the puzzle is casting the net. Here is where you have to make your pitch. Why would you be a good fit to the university? Which research groups you're interested to work with? So here are the last two paragraphs of my SOP. The second last paragraph mentions about the professors I'm interested to work with. But look at the last paragraph. Here is where I make my pitch. I say that I feel with that with the experience of doing both experimental and theoretical research, I would be able to contribute positively to the research output of MIT. This is my pitch. And here is where many students make a mistake. Many students write that what they will get from the university, that I will get to interact with the best professors, the best students, but they don't write about what they will bring to the table. Remember, it's a two-way street. So here I have written what I will bring to the table for MIT. MIT will also benefit from me contributing to the research output. And this is what is meant by making your pitch. You don't just have to write what you will get from the university. You have to write what you will give to the university as well. So for example, if you have been in the industry for too long, that can be your positive point because you can say that in the incoming cohort, I might be the only student with this much amount of industry experience. And this is what I can contribute to the incoming batch at MIT or whichever university you want to apply to. So make sure that your pitch or your ending is very, very strong. So in summary, there are four key elements of an ideal SOP. The first is the thread. The second is the hook. The third is the supporting cast. And the fourth is pitch make your pitch if all of these things come together you have a very strong sop if you don't have a hook don't worry you can cultivate the hook you still have four months to work on a research project and turn it into a publication now what i want to do is i want to go through uh, the next section which is uh, going through my statement of purpose so here in this section what we are going to do is that i'm just going to dissect my sop uh and I'm going to show how these different, these four elements came together in my MIT SOP. So here is my statement of purpose for MIT. And uh, you can see, first of all, that it's around 1450 words. And let me show you how the hook, the how the thread, the hook, the supporting cast and the pitch all came together. So I started with my vision, which is my thread that I want to create an impact in fluid mechanics. Then I wrote a story about how I discovered the field of fluid mechanics. And then in the immediately in the first page i wrote about my hook i wrote about this journal and the conference publication so some admissions committee when they read it they are already impressed by the time they reach this point then in the second page what i do is i write about my supporting cast so here you see i write about my itc experience then i write some things about my extracurricular activities etc and then in the last two paragraphs i make my pitch in the second last paragraph i write about the research groups i'm interested in and I have not written this randomly. 
I have actually searched about these groups and I made sure that they align with my work and my vision, my thread. And in the last paragraph is where I make my pitch to the university. So this is how I structured my SOP for MIT. It was around 1450 words and I use the same SOP for Stanford as well. So make sure that when you write your SOP, you also have these four elements, the vision, the hook, the supporting elements and pitch. Now, how to begin writing your SOP? First, decide your vision. Second, identify your hook. And if you don't find it, develop it. Third, identify the supporting elements. And fourth, prepare your pitch. So uh, decide your vision. So this is the thing which binds your SOP together. We all already discussed about this. A clear, strong vision sets the tone of your SOP. A scattered vision leads to a scattered and less effective SOP. Second, identify the hook. And if you don't find it, develop it. As I mentioned before, a strong research profile is one of the strongest hooks. Then identify your supporting elements. So these can be either advanced level courses, exchange programs, positions of responsibilities, teaching experience, entrepreneurship experience, industry experience, which is a bit different than your vision. All of these count. And then finally, prepare for your pitch. So as I mentioned, already start making a list of universities plus research groups which you are interested in. This will help you when you write the second last paragraph of your SOP. Identify three points regarding why the university should consider you or any other candidate. What you bring to the table. What is your pitch? And then finally, we'll also be sharing a link to the SOP masterclass which we have developed, which will teach you about different elements of the SOP writing process procedure, which I just described in detail. Now we are ready to come to part two in which Dr. Rajat is going to explain about letters of recommendation and resume preparation. So I'll just stop sharing screen here. Okay, uh, so let's move to part number two, which is uh, the next two documents in your application process, which are the letter of recommendation and the resume. The letter of recommendation is probably the most underrated document in uh, the list of documents that you prepare for the application process. We have seen a lot of students uh, take this particular document for granted and they push it till the till the very end of the application deadline and uh, later it becomes a process of uh, just finding someone quickly and getting the LOR drafted. Uh, I want to clarify here that this is one of the most important documents in your application and you should start thinking about it from right now. Uh, if, if you... If you have already thought of the professors, uh, then it's great. But if if you have not, then September is the right time uh, to start thinking about the three letters of recommendation, uh, three people who are going to endorse you for your application. So uh, there are three factors uh, while writing the letter of recommendation that we have to consider. The first is the credibility, which means who is the person who is writing the letter for you? A letter of recommendation uh, from a department head or from a professor counts a lot more as compared to an LOR from a PhD or a postdoc student. So the credibility matters. That's the first point. The second is the diversity of your letter of recommendation. All the three of us got two of our LORs from academia and one from industry. Also, if you get one LOR from an international professor, that also counts a lot because it shows that you are a student who are capable with uh, working with international uh, people also. And, and you are good at collaboration. The third, which is the most important, is the strength of the LOR. So what do I mean by strength of the LOR? Uh, mm -hmm. A strong LOR is an endorsement which generally comes after you have worked with someone for, uh, uh, for a long period of time. So let's say you work with a professor for 8 to 10 months. It means that that person can endorse you for a lot of skill sets, right? Not only can they endorse you for your academic skill set, they can also probably endorse you for your research skill set, your communication skills, your ability to work in a team, etc. That's why out of the three LORs, it is extremely important to have an LOR which is very, very strong. Uh, and and uh, you should start think of, uh, thinking about it from right now. If you have thought about it before, it's great. And since the deadline is just three months down the line, it is important that out of the three LORs, one LOR should be very strong. Uh, now, there are a lot of professors these days who are, who are asking students to write their own versions of LOR. 
this was not there probably four or five years back, but we are seeing this trend increasing uh, these days. Now, if you have that kind of responsibility, it means that you have a lot of control over the document because majority of the times, the professor will end up uh, sending the same LOR that you have drafted and, and given it to the professor. It means that you have a lot of control in writing the document, but with that also comes with a lot of responsibility. Uh, so I have seen that a lot of students in their LOR, they write very personal anecdotes that uh, when this particular student was in their 10th grade, uh, they got fascinated with robotics. It is very unlikely that your professor would be knowing what fascinated you in your 10th or 11th or 12th grade. So you have to make it sound realistic. Don't include a lot of personal anecdotes, which probably the professor will not be knowing about because then the admission committee will uh, can really catch on to uh, an LOR which is written by a student. The second area is LORs written by chat GPT. A professor is not going to use any generative AI tool to write an LOR. Even if it has grammatical mistakes, it is completely fine. It should look as authentic as possible. The moment you have words like delve, etc. in the LOR, it is something which admissions committee can really catch on. There are nowadays plagiarism checkers and it's very easy to catch LORs which are written by a Gen AI tool. And it completely defeats the purpose of a letter of recommendation. An endorsement uh, should come authentically from a person's mind. It should not come from an LLM. It is very important to note that please avoid using chat GPT for writing the letters of recommendation. And there is a very subtle difference between a generic and an exceptional LOR. It doesn't mean that you write something which is false, but it means that you have to sell yourself in the right way. A lot of students are very conservative in their approach while writing the LOR. It's completely fine if you boast about yourself a little bit. And I know it doesn't come naturally when we are in undergrad, but this is one thing we have learned uh, in various uh, instances and experiences that we have had that it's very important to boast about yourself a little bit. And it's completely fine if that comes across in your LOR. In fact, that will make your impact more in the document. Now, I want to go through a sample LOR to help you understand what do I mean by a strong LOR exactly. So along with the credibility and the diversity, the third point which I mentioned was a strong LOR. This was uh, this is a letter of recommendation which I consider to be very strong. Why? Firstly, because it is up to two pages long. It has a lot of paragraphs, which means that uh, this particular person probably has worked with this student for a long amount of time. That's why this uh, this person is able to endorse the student for multiple skill sets. So this endorsement was given to Sridhar by his professor uh, at MIT, and this 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 really is one of the benchmarks that we share with the students while they write their own LORs. Uh, so in the first paragraph, the professor endorses Sridhar about his research skill sets, uh, where the professor mentions that how how Sridhar. Uh, tackled a particular problem and uh, how he overcame the difficulties that he encountered while solving the problem and then how uh, the the paper was published to this journal etc. Oftentimes, the hook of your SOP uh, should be reflected in the LOR. So let's say in your SOP, the hook is the publication which you have written. Now, if you get an endorsement in the LOR from the same professor, it means that there is an immediate validation. The more validations that you have, the more coherent is your application going to look like. For example, if in your SOP you have written that I have submitted this paper, what is the proof that you have actually submitted this paper? But if you get an endorsement from a professor in the LOR saying that you have actually submitted this paper, it makes it sound more believable. And the admissions committee can uh, then find your documents more credible because the professor is endorsing you for the same thing. Then the, ne the next couple of paragraphs are, are devoted to uh, some other aspects of research. LORs can be a little technical. It is completely fine. Several paragraphs can have more technical details because the professor is going to write about more technical things that you have worked with them. In the latter part of the LOR, you can see that the endorsement shifts towards the communication and, and the presentation skill sets. 
which is what makes it a very uh, holistic recommendation because not just the research and the academic skill sets are endorsed for but also the communication skill sets are endorsed for so that's why uh, we believe that this is a very strong lor and whenever you are writing your set of lors or you are thinking of getting the three letter of recommendations please make sure that at least one lor is very very strong uh if you have it is already a little bit late to think of lors at this moment but uh september is the right time uh, don't don't push it till the very end okay so just to summarize there are three important factors when considering lors uh the credibility of the people who are writing the lors the versatility of your lors uh, for example division between academia and industry domestic professors international professors etc and finally the strength of the lor itself which always comes from a person whom you have worked for an extended period of time if you have control of writing the lor make sure that you don't use chat gpt uh, for writing individual paragraphs make it sound very authentic in nature and it's completely fine if the lor is a little bit technical also now the next document that i want to explain about is the resume a resume is like a 30 to 60 second pitch to the university uh an admission committee is probably going over a lot of documents which are the resume documents and you don't have much time to make an impact so the first page of your resume should be extremely impactful which means that more often than not the hook that you have mentioned in the sop that same hook goes in the first page of your resume so what do i mean by that here are two sample first pages of resumes which i have shown immediately you can see that in the first page itself there is an emphasis on publications and conference presentations which is what makes this candidate stand out from the rest of uh, the candidate pool because most of the candidates they mention their educational qualifications projects etc no one talks about publications and conference presentations directly in the first page of the uh, of the resume and this is something we highly recommend all of you to do mention your most impactful point directly in the first page of your resume if you have publications conference presentations it is excellent if not this can be the projects the more impactful projects you have done you can mention that in the first page of your resume itself uh again before we come to the first page the formatting of the resume also matters a lot we prefer using overleaf to make sure the resume is in latex format which looks way more professional you can always uh, use microsoft word also but make sure that there are no grammatical mistakes in any paragraph of your resume okay so the first take away from this is that the first page of your resume has to be very impactful it has to include the best point in your application and more often than not we stress on publications conference presentations patents because very rarely students mention that uh, directly in the first page of their resume uh, i want to show you my resume also uh, so i had academic qualification mentioned uh, first then i directly jumped on to the publications and the conference presentation section there is one very important point i want to stress upon here is that i did not have any publications which were submitted in any journal but i had one journal paper which was in preparation and one journal paper which was actually submitted to a journal it hadn't got accepted but i had written in bracket that in preparation and submitted which is something you can do as long as your professors endorse you in their letter of recommendation it is fine or at the bottom you can have your own portfolio website where you can link this work so if someone clicks on this website they can see the draft of the paper which you have sent to the journal so my first page looks very uh, very impactful because i have directly included the publications and the conference presentations in the first page the second page talks specifically about research projects i want to focus more on how uh, the project description is written because recently we have been reviewing a lot of resumes and students make a lot of mistakes while writing these three bullet points sometimes we have seen students write eight bullet points under one project sometimes we see them make mistakes in this tense for example they say i developed or 
uh, developing it is not consistent make sure the tense here is consistent like developed a robust mathematical algorithm successfully implemented etc so it should always be in a tense which is which is very consistent and you should include Im impactful metrics in every single line again do not take this for granted admissions committee do read every single line which you mention in these projects so uh, research projects and then after that i mentioned professional experience relevant coursework etc okay so uh, firstly you can see the formatting of this resume is is very professional the reason it looks a little bit different from word is because it's written in latex and then secondly the first page of the resume is very impactful the research projects are written in a nice way every single point is uh, carrying some weightage creating some kind of an impact and overall the resume looks very impressive so resume is something which does not take much time to write if you know which sections you have to write there are people who again uh, write it casually and they focus more on the sop but sop resume lor all these three documents should tell one coherent story one, one very important point here is that master's resume can be up to two pages long. PhD resumes can be up to three or four pages long. They can be a little bit longer as compared to a master's resume. And, and some of the do's and don'ts in the resume are that uh, don't mention uh, uh, online courses you have taken. That's, that's, that's true in your SOP also. A lot of students we have seen write one whole paragraph about online courses which they have taken which doesn't carry that much impact because a lot of students are doing online courses and it has become quite common nowadays uh, and then don't write your marital status gender motor vehicle license id number etc so uh, i just went through the sample resume also now in the next section uh, dr sridhar will uh, talk about the portfolio website and the long term mentorship also Thanks, Vijay. <clears throat> so, portfolio website is not among the mandatory documents, but many of the top students actually uh, have either maintained a portfolio website uh, well before the application or they create one just before the application. So, when I say portfolio website, I can show you two samples. One is from Dr. Raj. Uh, so, this is uh, his portfolio website and this was made using uh, something called github pages so github will allow you to host your uh, website whether it's a portfolio website or product website or whatever it is and this was created using an already existing template and here you can see that uh, within one glance you can see what raj is doing currently uh, the details were uh, from when he was doing phd but you can see that Everything is very clear from here. There are hyperlinks leading to LinkedIn, GitHub, Google Scholar, etc. And there is a publication section. Most of you in this call probably won't have publications to create this section in the first place. But for you, you can create a research section and add your research projects which are currently ongoing or uh, to be published, etc. in this section. And you can also add images. Uh, Raj has added uh, paper, code and the web page in which this uh, work was posted. But if you don't have these, if you have code, definitely put that in GitHub and uh, hyperlink the code. If you have a paper manuscript that is under preparation, you can add that to the portfolio website, some other page and hyperlink. And also add some, uh, you know, brief description of the project along with the list of the authors, list of the future authors or even current, current authors for unpublished papers. Uh, and uh, you can, if you have conducted workshops or seminars or web webinars or anything else, or even actual scientific conference talks, you can add that in a, in a separate section. And uh, anything extra which has a uh, visual nature, you can create a gallery section or media section and you can add here. I'll show you a similar thing from my own website as well. So here I had a few other sections also. I had a resume section, gallery section, awards section, research, startups, etc. So in the about section, I wrote a small paragraph describing who am I, what am I doing, what are my general interests when it comes to research? Then in the research section, actually, I listed uh, published papers, yet to be published papers, ongoing work, everything. Uh, so this website I did not use while applying to PhD. I, I created it later for another purpose. But basically, uh, the way I showcased website was a uh, project was I had a thumbnail image, uh, which was taken directly from the uh, my project. 
uh, it represented the entire website in one snapshot. Then title of the uh, the future paper or already published paper, if there is a link that and uh, where it is published and the list of authors. I have also, I can also show you, uh, just look at this one. This is also, oh, this website is not accessible. Basically, I just wanted to show you another student website, which is one of the best ones that I have come, come across re recently. So that student had added uh, four buttons associated with each project. He had a uh, abstract code, then uh, he had a uh, paper, paper or report. And then for some projects, he had also like some video to explain the project. So uh, each button, when you click each button, it will open that corresponding item. You can also do something like that. If you don't have a video uh, explaining the project, you yourself can record one, right? You just open Zoom or something like that and record a two minute video explaining your, uh, your project. And it could be Canva slides, uh, PowerPoint slides, and you are explaining through that in two minutes and just add that as a video that is describing the project. So these, th these are the things which are very uh, minimum effort things which you can do. And you might be wondering to make these websites, how much time is it, is it going to take? Actually, it is going to take you less than a day uh, once you have all the material ready. Uh, so this Google sites uh, I created in maybe eight to 10 hours or slightly more than that. Uh, but I had all the material ready in my local computer folder. Then I just added that to an already existing Google Sites template. Uh, startups thing everyone won't have, but in media, here I have put a bunch of uh, the news items that was published in uh, various media uh, from my work. In this resume section, the advantage is that you can upload the latest version of, the res of your resume even after you submit your application. So you can keep updating this version of the resume, which the admissions committee might see. And uh, in the gallery section, you can add, uh, if you have conducted a lecture, if you have a recording of that, or if you have uh, uh, conducted some online event, if you have a recording of that, put that in YouTube. If you are shy to put something publicly, you can put it as something called as unlisted video on YouTube. So that way only people with a link will get access. It won't be publicly available on YouTube. So there are many such things that you can do. Uh, even if your projects are in a nascent stage or not so developed stage, in awards, you can put any any kind of award which you have won in your whole life. You don't have to restrict it uh, from, let's say, 2020 onwards. In your resume, typically we say don't include awards and things which were maybe more than seven or eight years older. Uh, but in portfolio website, you can pretty much include anything that you have won in your life. So this is the philosophy of portfolio website where you get a chance to uh, completely upsell yourself and, and show total professionalism. And uh, one more thing is it's dynamic, right? So uh, if a paper get published, how do you communicate that the fact that this got published to the admissions committee, the way this is communicated is through portfolio website in the landing page. You make a banner after it's published. Uh, let's say you submit your, paper, uh, your application in December, 1st of December. And by January 15th, if some, some, some major change is happening to your profile, you can communicate that with the admissions committee through your portfolio website. Um, and it will also help you when you email professors. So uh, when you email them, other than attaching the resume, you can also attach your uh, a hyperlink to your portfolio website. So that, so that way they can go through it. In fact, one of the MIT professors who wanted to interview me uh, after I got the admit, he wanted a, a link to my portfolio website and I, it was so embarrassing. I did not have a portfolio website at that time. So uh, whereas most of my friends had a portfolio website. So no one told me that I had to create it because it was not part of the application documents. So I thought, why make one if there, if it's not mandatory? But that's not the way you should think. You should think, is this an opportunity to sell your profile better? If yes, just do that. So uh, we have something called as long-term mentorship. I'll just show you a couple of details of that. And then maybe uh, we can take some questions. Uh, but before entering into all of that, I just wanted to tell you a principle which will act as uh, the guiding light for your entire applications and in the specific context of some of the questions. So uh, I saw some questions where people had asked, is a preprint, can I add preprint in the publication section of the resume? Uh, so I have a question, right? So you must have heard of this paper called Attention is All You Need that has um, more than one lakh citations now. It was the uh, one of the first papers that introduced the current transformer model, right? Uh, which is powering most of the large language models. Um, is, is that paper a publication or not? 
of course it's a publication it's a it's one of the most famous publications that came out in the last few years uh it is published in archive now would you uh, if you were the first author of that paper would you call that as a publication or would you call that as a hobby project or something so it depends on what you what you think it is right so whether it your your archive publication has 1 lakh citations or whether it has zero citations it's ultimately a publication you should definitely definitely mention it in the publication section of the resume and nowhere else uh if you are planning to submit it into a journal you should also mention that in the in the resume so these are called upselling techniques you should never ever downsell uh the i think two or three weeks ago i saw a candidate uh, who had actually very good publications and his resume was overall very good looking but uh, he put his work experience and a few other experiences in the first and second page and then he put publications as the very last section and he was applying for a phd so i was like how does this make sense if i am a professor who is trying to admit you for phd do, would i like to know about your work experience or would i like to know about your publications primarily of course work experience also is valuable i want to know more about your publications because that is what is showing your research acumen and uh, uh, that that is not so ob obvious to many candidates because they think from some other perspective which is not not from this sales point of view so we we usually talk about this banana seller analogy think think like a banana seller who's trying to sell their good or bad or medium any kind of banana as the best possible thing that their their customers can get and the universities who claim that they have the best department in the world they are trying to sell what they are doing to attract the best possible students uh, so they want to get the best students from this webinar if there are 135 students the top universities would like to get the best among you there similarly your goal should be to attract the best possible universities towards you so it's like a fair game you show your best face to them they will show your best face to you um, so try to you know incorporate this principle any time you are applying this this also applies to job applications anything but in the context of uh, phd or masters admissions this is most relevant uh, i will not talk about phase 1 because this we have completely stopped now for all all fall 2025 applicants if you are applying for fall 2026 or later and if you want to know more about this LTM phase one, you can just email us. But I'll skip this slide for now. Uh, currently, we have phase two, but very limited number of uh, students we are taking. We may have few openings because, uh, first of all, it's already September. Uh, I don't know the date. Yeah, 19th, right? Uh, and the most of the deadlines are coming in end of uh, November. So we may have a few spots for uh, SOP uh, crafting and a few other items in phase two. Uh, it basically involves everything about the application documents where your story is at stake. Um, your your GPA is fixed. Everything else is fixed. Ultimately, now it has time to it, it's time to tell your story in the best possible way. So this phase two is all about that. GRE TOEFL we don't have an official program for that. We just uh, uh, we are neither interested to teach people about GRE. We are nor experts at that. But basically, you can you know uh, uh, we'll share some material that most of the people last year have successfully used um i'll skip this um yeah i will also skip this because we have uh i'll also skip this because these are some papers uh, which are more relevant for phase one so if anyone in this call is ever interested in something related to research paper uh please uh email us we'll share the email in the chat we don't want to use this time to talk about papers because it's more important right now for you, all of you if you are applying for fall 2025 uh your uh stories the the like the SOP resume LORs university shortlisting those are the things that you should focus on right now. If you are already work if you were already working on papers, try as much as possible to wrap them up. Of course, you can do that. Um, but last year actually we had pretty good outcome. Uh, at the end of the day, we had uh, five students getting into CMU, five into Johns Hopkins. Um, I don't remember the exact number, five or six. Uh, then a few into UIUC, Cornell. Uh, one student got into Duke. So it was extremely uh, good results. In fact, we got, uh, I mean, a couple of students told us uh, that the professor who admitted them for PhD was also parts of the admission, part of the admissions committee. And they said that their SOP was one of the best SOPs that they saw that year. And uh, we were very happy to hear that because we had put so much effort into creating a, a good story in the SOP. So so it was it was a good feedback directly coming from the you know, sort of like the horse's mouth. Um, and I will skip this. I will also skip this. 
one more thing, uh, guys, is we have a, a program called Scientific Machine Learning. Uh, we talk about that in some of the webinars. Basically, Scientific Machine Learning is, again, this is not uh, limited to um, fall 2024 or 2025 applicants. This is open currently. Uh, basically, this is mainly meant for people from any background, not just computer science background. If you ever wish to pitch your profile in an ML angle, but let's say you are from computer science or mechanical engineering or civil engineering, what can you really do other than taking some uh, courses or Kaggle projects or trying to, you know, trying your luck with um, some of the uh, maybe research papers from your with your professors? What, what else can you do? Something you can do is like trying to produce something tangible. One problem with working with professors is like they are either not so motivated in all the colleges, they are either slow, you won't get to choose your topic and you won't get to publish at your pace. So this bootcamp has been incredibly successful because many students have even submitted their work to NeurIP's uh, workshop. Uh, who, and, and in fact, there were there are 50 or so workshops. Many of them had deadline on September 13th, like last week. And uh, several of our students who graduated from scientific machine learning bootcamp actually pub, uh, submitted their paper to workshop. Uh, in fact, a couple of high school students uh, recently submitted their paper to a very prestigious conference called MIT URTC. It's mostly for undergrad students. Uh, and they both of them got it accepted. So they are now going to MIT on October 13th or 12th or something uh, to present their work. So uh, this has been incredibly successful. So uh, we'll share the link in the chat, but check check this out. Raj, do you, do you want to talk about some details of this? Or yeah, okay, I'll mute myself. Yeah. Uh... So I just want to quickly talk about the scientific ML bootcamp and show you the website which we have currently. So here you can see that the website itself is designed to, so this is the curriculum of the bootcamp and which we have designed based on our PhDs at MIT. And as Sridhar was saying, irrespective of which field you are in, if you want publications in the field of machine learning, if you want to transition to the field of machine learning, the projects which you will do in this bootcamp are projects which are not there anywhere on the internet. So this is pretty unique and this will be a very strong point on your profiles. Here is a snapshot of some of the projects which you will be doing mixing physics and machine learning. So these are pretty cool projects and there are different plans. If you want to publish a paper, the researcher plan is the perfect fit for you. Student plan, then uh, community plan, they are best for students who just want to learn about this subject. And in case there are industry professionals in this call right now, you can even go for the industry professional plan. So this program has been a huge success since we launched it in January and we are continuing it right now. The next batch, in fact, is starting on in two to three days. So please email us at hello at the rate fly with .com. If you're interested, then you can even uh, check out this link, which I've shared in the chat right now. I'll just stop sharing my screen and Shridhar can maybe continue with the rest. Uh, yes. Let me share my screen. So yeah, uh, so please do check that. Uh, we have shared the link in the description. Actually, there are several projects that we have uh, came up with. Some of them are actually group projects. Group project as in uh, big, big enough projects for two people or in one of the projects that we are envisioning we are planning to take six students because it's like a mega project on COVID. Um, so people have done research on uh, COVID after Raj published his first ML, ever ML paper on COVID study, incorporating scientific machine learning. After that, many people studied COVID in different regions, but there has not been a comprehensive study that looked at how COVID was spreading and can scientific machine learning can be used for um, kind of predicting the COVID spread in all the different regions, right? So we are planning like a SciML COVID mega project in which we are planning to work with maybe five or six very enthusiastic students, but we haven't uh, officially started it yet. We are still looking for the best possible students for that. So uh, if you are part of the SciML uh, and if you are, plus if you are also really good, we can uh, consider that. And we have a few other uh, projects as well, which are not related to COVID. But uh, this has been very, very surprisingly, extremely successful um, for most of the students. Like we did not expect students to learn uh, Julia language first and then scientific machine learning framework and then learn about research paper publication and then actually do all that, get technical results, 
then write the paper so it's it, it sounds a little bit intimidating and we were initially when we started the plan uh, the boot camp we thought uh, it may not be that easy as easy as we imagined but it turned out to be much better than what we thought so it's amazing uh, anyways coming to the last section before getting into some q and a so uh, since you all have assuming i assume you have decided to apply for grad school ms or phd or mba or whatever uh, in these good universities it's a great decision um, if things work out you should definitely definitely do that uh, because even if you don't plan to stay in that country us or europe wherever it is uh, if you, even if you don't plan to stay there for the rest of your life, even if you are just going there for getting education, that itself is a transformative experience. That has been the case for all of us. So even though we decided to come back to India after finishing our PhD, the five years that we spent uh, at these top institutions really transformed us as individuals, transformed our capabilities, the way we think, the way we speak, everything. So uh, it's, a, it's a highly recommended decision if uh, financially it makes sense to you. Um, so uh, really, really uh, good decision. So we won't have 15 to 20 minutes for Q&A. Our original plan was to conduct this webinar till 8.30 p.m. today, but uh, we have some, we ha uh, ended up having some commitments. So we have to wrap up this by close to 8 p.m. So we have time for maybe two to three more questions from the chat and remaining questions we can address through email. Uh, you can send us an email. Um, so we'll be taking some from the chat, but uh, just if you want to reach out to us, uh, please send an email to this particular email, hello at flyvidesh.com. And uh, we'll be sharing the recording uh, as a YouTube video link. Uh, we'll be hosting it on our YouTube. So you can just check, you know, you can just check our YouTube channel. We'll uh, mention the name of the YouTube channel in the chat. But if you are specifically interested in LTM or, or SIML, just send us an email mentioning your details. Please don't send a one-liner email. Uh, and also please attach if you have a, decent version of your latest resume please attach that and uh, yeah we can maybe take a couple of questions from the chat and then uh, wind up today's webinar but guys we'll we'll have uh, most likely another webinar on sop writing uh, specifically so uh, by either end of this month or somewhere before first week of uh, october so uh, we we can meet again in that webinar but uh, any specific questions related to application documents Uh, many okay. students, I, sorry, uh, I saw many students asking questions about, I have this much GPA, I have these many publications, uh, should I apply to MIT? I, uh, don't you guys think it's a bit extreme kind of thinking, like, uh, should you not be thinking in terms of realistic universities? The reason why I'm saying this is even when we were applying, uh, our realistic targets were different universities. We thought, okay, if we get into MIT, well, it's fine. If we don't, we'll figure it out. But our, our realistic plan was about universities where people usually get admits. So I think whoever is asking these questions, instead of putting all eggs in the top university basket, you should have a good list of easy, medium, dream universities and trying to maximize your chances of getting, your, getting an admit rather than trying to think, I'll try MIT, Harvard, uh, you know, uh, Cambridge, Oxford, some top five universities and getting all, all rejects. I don't think it's a good strategy at all. Uh, yes, you will need multi. Go ahead, Raj. Yeah, I was uh, I was looking at some questions in which people had asked about work experience and whether it helps or not. So, in my general experience, whether applying for a master's or a PhD, a work experience is always helpful because the work experience shows that you are capable of solving industry level problems. So, if you have uh, two to three years of job experience don't think that it will hurt your chances of getting into a master's it can actually help you in fact in many cases it does and remember that sop is usually an opportunity to convert your weaknesses into points of strength um, so whatever weaknesses you all have such as gap year or uh, too much time away from academia those can be converted into points of strength in your sop as well yeah so thank you, everyone. We'll have to uh, close the webinar earlier tonight, but uh, please don't take stress. We know that deadlines are nearing, but uh, as much as possible, try to stay calm and uh, just do your work. Uh, results will naturally come if you just keep um, 
you know doing things with good intention so just just prepare your documents if you have not thought of which universities you are applying to just just create a list in excel sheet and uh, just slowly uh, one at one thing at a time you, you just finish it there is time in front of you you just need to stay relaxed as much as possible and do it and if there is any concern please email us uh, but thank you so much everyone we'll see you again in the next webinar thank you everyone. bye yeah bye bye take care